All right, so good morning. So can you please uh, state your name for the video, please? David B. Hamilton. So you were originally volunteered, enlisted in the U.S. Army straight after Pearl Harbor? Right. Yes. Yeah. He, he felt that he needed to do your duty to, uh, to get, a, get a back out at the Japs? Or, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what did they get at him? Yeah. But you had a, a, a more of a, a desire to fly? Oh, I definitely wanted to fly. Yeah. My father had been a pilot in World War I, and my brother was a co-pilot with United Airlines when Pearl Harbor hit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to fly. So you went through um, flight school, so you, you, you managed to... Yeah, get, I went get, through flight school. Yeah. There was a slight uh, hesitation. They operated on my ears in primary, and uh, I eventually graduated twin engine advanced in Waco, Texas, in March of 43. Yeah. And then was assigned to the 436? No, right away I went to the B-47 school, the C-47 school at Bergstrom in Austin, Texas. Yeah. And that was 30 days. Then I went to the 436 troop carrier group in Alliance, Nebraska. And we were there for about three months. And then we went to Laurenburg Maxton, which was in North Carolina, right on the border, North Carolina and South Carolina. Yeah. And uh, from there we went to Bearfield, Indiana, picked up new airplanes, went to Palm Beach and flew the southern route to England. Yeah. I had an engine go out on me trying to get through to Marrakesh in Morocco, and I waited 10 days for it engine to come and get put together uh -huh. so uh yeah. we eventually went up to england and yeah we were at bodisford when i was pulled in by my group commander and he said uh, if i wanted to go to pathfinders and so i said yes <laughs> and i went to pathfinders in february of 1944. Mm. so that would have been uh to cottesmore airfield raf cottesmore and uh, we were there for about 30 days. Yeah. And then we went across the road and up a little bit to North Witham. Yeah. And that was the Pathfinder headquarters yeah. for uh, Normandy and for the south of France. And uh, came back and then we moved to Shalgrove outside of Oxford. Yeah. Um, what recollections do you have for Cottesmore for your 30 days that you were there? Well, it was a wonderful, it was a permanent RAF base. And... Uh, it was, uh, you know, the kind of a base that uh, had been there for a long time, had quite a history. And uh, in the Officers Club Visitors Book, 1937, I think it was, was Herman Goring's name. <laughs> and, of course, uh, he wasn't uh, available <laughs> any longer for no. us. So you were living in huts uh, on, the, on the base, or was there more, more permanent kind of residence? Well, it was a permanent base of the 316th Troop Carrier Group and also the Wing Headquarters. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So North Witham, was it a, a completely different type of airfield to, to oh, Cottesmore? Oh, yes, it wasn't a permanent airfield. Yeah. We lived in Nissan huts. Everything was in Nissan huts, yeah. including the officers' club, the officers' mess, the uh, enlisted men's mess. NCO club, everything, yes. Yeah. So you, uh, so it would be in roughly around April time you went over to North with them? Yes, probably a little earlier, maybe mid-March. Right, okay, yeah. So for the, as soon as you went to North with them, were you kind of aware that, that D-Day was fast approaching oh, and, yeah. the, and, tra well, and we training were, intensified? We didn't get, as the British called it, bigoted, which meant you were briefed on it until May 28th. Yeah when we got briefed and then they sealed us and uh, they took away our air identification cards. We weren't allowed to make phone calls, uh, which in my case was just because my mother was in the American Red Cross in London running a Rainbow Gardens Club. Yeah. Not to be able to tell her or see her or anything, but I did get in touch with her after Normandy, yes. Yeah. So what type of training were you doing prior to D-Day. Well, we trained in, with the stick 
and the requirement of being a pathfinder was you had to jump one time as your commander of an airplane with the paratroopers you were going to drop. And uh, General Gavin was so pleased, General Gavin being the commander of the 82nd Airborne, although at that time he was the assistant division mm. commander. And I think the youngest general in the Air Force. Yes. I, and uh, he personally presented us 20 aircraft commanders with our jump wings, which saved us from having a blast with the paratroopers <laughs> and probably getting wiped out. <laughs> yeah. But we also got our green instrument cards uh, before Normandy from our group commander, and uh, Colonel Crouch flew with each of us and gave us an instrument check, and we were given green instrument cards, which were then pretty much reserved for senior officers. Yeah. And that uh, caused quite a stir when I'd go to another base and show my green instrument card. <laughs> you could sign your own clearance. All you had to do was guarantee you'd check the weather. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so what's your recollections of Colonel Crouch? He was a wonderful man, great leader, and great fun. And he really appreciated what we were doing in our mission. And uh, was, I think he made a lot of us much better officers and pilots than we had been when we went there. Yeah. Was he um, firm but fair, he would say? Yes, I'd say he's firm but fair. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he wasn't averse to having a good party. Yeah. And he was a very good poker player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you were assigned, obviously, a C-47 at Pathfinder School. Yes. Which, obviously, is 330. 330. Yeah. Uh, did you name it at all? No, you weren't allowed to have anything other than the yellow tail number yeah. on the airplane. Yeah. You weren't allowed to even put your name under the window. And uh, we were the only organization in troop carrier that didn't have a great big number and a letter yeah. up in front. And a lot of names are written around it. Yeah. But we did have the black and white stripes painted on our planes, and that was a dead giveaway. Uh, but by then, we'd been bigoted. Mm. We were bigoted on May 28th, and I think they part painted the stripes on June 2nd or 3rd. Yeah. And, uh, and that was the crew chief's responsibility to... See to, that it was done properly. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the, so the original uh, D-Day invasion was supposed to happen. Well, it on was the, delayed, postponed 24 hours that's right. because of weather. And uh, that uh, didn't really cause any uh, disturbance at all, markedly. The troop carrier boys took it in, in stride, and the paratroopers uh, just, uh, as far as I could see, got a little extra sleep sharpen their bayonets a little more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, the 5th of June, the weather is improving. They gave us a break on the weather. They said there was going to be a series we could go in. And uh, we formed our airplanes up in order to take off. And uh, we had photographs taken. And then we loaded up and took off around 10 o'clock, I took off around 10 o'clock, and by the time I got to the drop zone, it was about 15 minutes after 1 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And uh, we dropped our troopers and uh, came out, and uh, it was a little hairy going in because we got low-level flak and anti-aircraft uh, from uh, the Germans, and I think they probably gave us more little tiny holes, 25 millimeter or whatever they called it, Schmeisers. And the only thing of a big gun that hit at all was a bullet that went up in the magnetos of my airplane and a wingtip. Yeah. And uh, got back to England and I couldn't turn the engines off in the normal fashion. I had to cut the gas off and sit there while the rest of the boys were down on the ground kissing it and doing whatever they needed to do. <laughs> and then I just had to wait there filling out my forms until the gas started the engines. But the plane was 
back flying in four days, which was a great credit to my crew chief and to the uh, staff and the maintenance in the because I wasn't the only plane that was injured. Yeah. So we eventually, after much study and everything, they found that our drops were tremendously accurate. And uh, on the whole, we did a very good job. Yeah. So we turn back time to uh, the photograph that was taken in front of your C-47. Yes. Now, was that a directive by Troop Carry Command for a photograph of the crew and the, uh, the, and the paratroopers? Or I imagine it? it came from the Public Relations Department, um, whether it was Troop Carry or Ninth Air Force, or maybe it was just uh, the base. But I have an idea that there were a lot of other groups that weren't Pathfinders mm. where they did the same thing, yeah. I think. Was it kind of a very... Uh, Upbeat atmosphere when the photograph was taken, everybody uh, laughing, joking. Yeah. Well, pretty much so, yeah. 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 With some water amount anxiety yeah, intermixed. Yeah, there was also some ribald or rather not clean comments made about how <laughs> everyone looked. <laughs> <laughs> but once we got in the airplane, it sort of quieted down. And uh, we were very quiet on the flight. We just, uh, in the cockpit area, we were following the directions of the navigator because basically we were chauffeurs for our navigator. Yeah. They had all the radar, they knew where we were. And uh, once we hit the land and that, before we went into that cloud bank, uh, we could very well tell pretty close to where we were mm. from the study of the sand tables that we'd done yeah. with the paratroopers. Were you wearing anything um, different for the for the flight? Flak vests, flak helmets. Well, I had a flak vest on, and I had a flak helmet on, and uh, I found them rather cumbersome. Mm. And uh, uh, some time later, we found a. Uh, I think it was uh, after we came back from uh, Italy, as a matter of fact, the south of France invasion. My crew chief found a sheet of steel uh, armor plate out of a B-26 and all the throat mics and my plane was rigged with a, a sheet of uh, armor plate on um, co-pilot and pilot side and uh, uh, we had all stations with throat mics which made it a lot easier. We didn't have to reach over and grab the hand mic and yeah. hold it. And, so it, it, it was uh, more comforting, and it did away with the fact that I needed or felt that I needed a flak suit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I've heard most of the navigators and radio operators would sit on their flak vests. Oh, yeah. Just to protect their crown jewels. Yeah. <laughs> well, the navigator and the radio operator did. Yeah. My crew chief was running around so much, I don't think he ever did. He would pop up into the little plastic air cupola up above and check formations and what was going on up there but uh, no, we were we were very fortunate after that until we got to the mission in Bastogne in December we didn't have any real problems even going into Holland I did five missions into Holland and uh, we had some anti-aircraft but they the British RAF Tempest put down those boats they were mostly in canals uh, Germans and they dropped the sides open and out would come a gun. Yeah. But the Brits were wonderful. We had great fighter escort in Holland. Yeah. Um, so, so, Southern France, uh, half of the Pathfinder School went over to Italy, I believe. Ten crews went down around D plus 30. Uh, ten of the Pathfinder crews we were told to report and we reported and went to uh, St. Evelyn and down. Uh, to Gibraltar and uh, Casablanca and uh, then across North Africa and then up Naples, Rome and we were based in Marsigliano at the turn of the Tiber River there just outside of Rome, yeah. a grass field where our ten planes were based. Yeah. That was it. And you, you were assigned to uh, drop British I was miners. personally assigned to drop British uh, a company of British paratroopers. Yeah. 
and the a actual drop. Because had nine planes fly the night of the invasion of southern France, and I was the aerodrome officer, and my co-pilot was the officer of the day on a rotating roster. So we just got picked up for a mission on the morning. The other boys had resupply missions. We had a mission to drop a, a stick, and uh, there was another plane in the formation that dropped the other part of the company. Yeah. And uh, there were two platoons of British paratroopers went in. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that the, uh, was it the op Operation Dragoon, as, as it was formerly called, yes. was a bit of a... It was a champagne campaign <laughs> uh, in comparison to any of the others we saw. Yeah, it was rather well done, I thought. <laughs> yeah. No anti-aircraft fire. Nice weather. Yeah. So, but it sounds like you had more of a adventurous time returning back to England after the, the campaign. Oh, I had a very adventurous time. We flew from Gibraltar, from Marsigliano. We came back and uh, flew eventually to Gibraltar, where we spent the night and gassed up. Then came back up Fourth Meridian and went to St. Evel, where we stopped for breakfast and a weather briefing and gassed up. And then I went to the right seat and my co-pilot took over flying. And our weather briefing was very erroneous and a very fast moving, very rapid uh, and heavy cold front came through the Bristol Channel and the southern part of England and Wales. And we uh, crashed because of the weather. It tore the wingtips off and the root fairies of the airplane and we crashed at the top of the mountain with no damage to anything in the plane except we lost three cases of Italian wine, which was <laughs> disappointing. But the passengers and everybody was fine. We went and got picked up by a RAF, who we reported to once we were on the ground and stopped our radio. Still worked for navigational purposes. We called Bonstable Control and they sent up a truck and uh, put guard on our airplane because of the radar that was on it and the rain by that time it stopped because this was about four hours three hours later in the middle of the day so that was the end of 330 that was the end of 330 for a long time the plane was reclaimed taken they took the wings off eventually took the plane and they put the wings back on and fixed it i flew it once and it had a tendency to be difficult to trim up. Hmm. And by that time, I'd gotten a new airplane anyway. So yeah. it was given to one of the new boys. Yeah. And uh, he always asked me, he said, something wrong with the, you can't trim the plane up. And I told him the whole story of our crash. And he said, gee, I wish I was a captain. I <laughs> wouldn't have to take it. <laughs> <laughs> So from North Witham, you moved to Shardgrove, which was outside of Oxford. Uh, was that before December? Or yes. So well, that was before December. Yeah. And uh, we went from Shardgrove, and uh, the Battle of the Bulge started on the 16th of December, and they moved the 82nd and the 101st Airborne from their camps in France. Uh, the 101st went to Bastogne, and the 82nd went north uh, on the what became the north shoulder of the Battle of the Bulge, and uh, came under the command uh, eventually of uh, General Montgomery because the, they split the command between Bradley and Montgomery, uh, and. The Battle of Bulge was a mess, real bad. Mm. Hitler's attempt to knock this out of the war, really. But I don't know if he really believed, well, maybe he did believe he could do it, but we had preponderance of air power and it was strangled because of the weather for a while. And when the weather broke, we went in. The weather in England was atrocious. Everything covered with a half an inch of ice. And we went to Membry, where my old 436 group was, 
and across the field from them was a large material command headquarters yeah. and we took aboard in addition to the ammunition foodstuffs and medicine that we were going to drop we took a fellow from uh, the uh, maintenance outfit who was to help us push the stuff out of the door and uh, they uh, they were very brave guys those guys I think one of them uh, I may be wrong on this he was killed but he got a medal of honor I think, mm. uh, in the Battle of the Bulge on that day yeah which was December 23rd and we went in and dropped our things we went unfortunately down a road where there was a German panzer division so I had to break radio silence and slide the group of planes that I was running I, I moved them over a field and we went in and got away from some of the fire but uh, we went in and dropped our stuff and we took an awful lot of damage from the small period of time we were on that 12 mile run uh, of the 27 planes I only took nine back to England that night, yeah. and the rest landed at different uh, bases in France and Belgium, and uh, they had damage or they had wounded aboard, and uh, it was a lash up. Yeah. I didn't get back to North with them actually that night. I landed at Manston, which had a three mile long runway, <laughs> and wide, it was a crash strip and everything else, down on the very, very end of the land first land you hit coming back from that part of the, the world when you hit the british isles yeah and uh this is the mission your crew chief was here to believe yes my yeah. crew chief had hit in the arm and lost his arm in that mission and i lost him and i also by that time had a new new co-pilot because when the expansion of pathfinders to a provisional troop carrier group with four squadrons we uh, got a lot of the co-pilots became first pilots, aircraft commanders, and we took in a lot of people, did a lot of training between Market Garden and Bastogne in December. We did a tremendous amount of training, but there were always ten, eight or ten airplanes that were flying gasoline over to Patton for his tanks. Yeah. He was going through... Uh, France like uh, shit through a goose. <laughs> <laughs>